Hey guys, it's Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we have a presentation from Linda Bradford Rasky, and she has asked to talk about the volume and price relationship. Some of the bullet points include pattern recognition versus quantifiable studies, four main volume patterns for intraday scalping, trade management using volume patterns, putting volume and price in the proper context, and some additional volume and divergence techniques. Linda has asked that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Uh, so once she's done presenting, then we'll open up the uh, webinar for Q&A. I do want to remind everybody that the webinar is being recorded, and I'll post the recording on BMT sometime tomorrow. I will also send that link to Linda so she can get it to her followers. Uh, today we're also giving away five autographed copies of the book Traders at Work and Linda has selected this book. She's written up in the book as one of the world's most successful traders and we uh, will get those books autographed for the five winners today during the webinar. So pay attention to the content because of the quiz questions at the, en at the end of the webinar will be directly related to the content that Linda presents today. Okay guys and with that here comes Linda. Awesome. Thanks again, guys, for hosting me here. It's uh, going into that springtime when everybody's uh, just a little bit lethargic from uh, exceptional volatility and uh, range and, and trading opportunities in the last four months. And uh, sometimes it's fun to have new stuff to uh, think about or different ways of looking at data. So one of the things that I'm going to present today is uh, volume. And with that said, I wanted to, as an aside, say that Volume is a supplementary indicator in and of itself. It doesn't necessarily create uh, buy or sell signals. It's always something that needs to be put into context. And it's a little bit of a luxury, I think, nowadays to have so much data uh, available to us uh, because, uh, let's see here, because uh, um, many years ago when I started on the floor, we did not have electronic platforms, we did not have a volume, and uh, even when we started trading in the pits, uh, there was no such thing as accurate timely volume, and nowadays, of course, everything's so uh, instantaneous that uh, we have many more tools at our disposal, and I know that many of you are market profile aficionados, and uh, there we go. And so what I'm going to do is I just want to give you my basic philosophy on the markets before I delve down and uh, then give you some finer things that hopefully you'll find instrumental in doing a little bit of tape reading or uh, thinking about additional things to think about. So uh, what I'm just going to show you over the next two slides is uh, not what I'm going to talk about today, but I wanted you to understand what my style is. And ultimately, as you well know, everybody uh, needs to find their own style in the marketplace and just pick one tool and specialize in it. Uh, I was greatly influenced by basic swing trading, which is nothing more than watching the patterns of the highs and the lows. And I was uh, influenced greatly by a book that I read in the late 80s called The Taylor Trading Technique. And I'm sure that many of you that have tried to wade through this book would agree that it is not the finest edition of English literature. However, it did influence me, and still to this day, I think the most important concept that we can always remember is, what is the trend for the day? So much of my work is based on trying to capture the trend for the day. Are we looking to trade from low to high or high to low? and capturing a piece of that, and if it is a good trend for the day with an increase in volume, almost always try and hold overnight for a little bit of extra follow through. Um, almost everything I do, I do quantify. I, I've done extensive modeling and testing for the last 20 years, and so that's some of the things that we've worked on with these short-term volume studies. What you see on a chart here is just simply uh, daily candles. And again, I'm just presenting this because where I'm going to go from here is a totally opposite about face. And what I want you to understand with the tools that I'm going to show you is they're just simply a way of watching the roadmaps or the signs along the way. Um, this is something that I'll be talking about in June at Mike's special uh, monthly 
uh, workshops, and uh, it, it definitely is how I make the bulk of my uh, uh, living, is looking for the days that we've had two days high to low, for example, and a divergence in the two period rate of change. I'm looking for a buy day or basically a trend day going from low to high the next day. So it's very much that, uh, looking for the flips up or down. And it's very much also looking for something that you might be familiar with in terms of market profile concepts called uh, the little balance areas, three bar balance areas. I always call them three bar triangles. You can see here on this chart where the day's high is lower than the two day high and the day's high, or low rather, is higher than the two day low. And so this is a little pattern that tests out exceptionally well in terms of breakouts. Um, and you can see we can quantify this as well. So many ways to skin a cat or see the same type of data. Here was a little three bar balance area or consolidation, if you will. You can see the low volatility point, which led to the upside breakout, of course, magically triggered by news. And, um, you know, the main thing that we want to look at on these breakout periods is volume for confirmation or non-confirmation. And what I find in my own trading is maybe two out of ten trades, three out of ten trades are really big wins. And so that's what we're playing for. And uh, so hopefully I'll be able to introduce some more pattern recognition to you with just trying to decide is it going to be a breakout mode for the day or trading range or uh, low to high day or high to low day, and in addition to some modeling uh, such as our extended runs, this is a five period simple moving average, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, once we get seven closes on one side of the moving average, you can expect a much greater degree of trendiness, uh, for example, if you bought on the close of day seven and sold on day 14, the odds are that net net you will have a positive expectation. And the first close below is always a buy, so we call that a 5 SMA trade. So welcome to my world. This is how I frame things out. Uh, basically two to three day, two to three day little words for how I'm going to approach that market the next day. Am I going to look to buy a dip or sell a retracement or go with a breakout? And if that's all there were to the game. Um, just lastly, there's two other little parts to my game, and that is waiting for the big, broad daily chart formations. And this is something here that I think that all of you are very familiar with, the, the little bit of a wedge. And we'll look at um, some gorgeous little chart examples intraday that are fabulous scalping opportunities. But the wedge, one, two, three pushes with converging trend lines, very important. And the thing to remember is that these things just don't happen that often. So it's very much a patience game in waiting for those higher time frame things to set up, as well as the short term scalping, which I try to do every day. I always try to do two or three S&P scalps a day, and I'll make anywhere from two to four scalps in uh, some of the other markets, and that's what we're going to concentrate on today is really uh, the short term scalping, which ideally is going to be there to smooth your bottom line. If you're a newer trader and you're just starting out, I would strongly encourage everybody just to learn to scalp only. And there's two reasons for that. You know, when I was starting off in the pits, uh, you know, we were basically flipping one lots, you know, buying a call and trying to sell it for a tick higher and vice versa. And the thing to understand is that the execution side of the game does take a lot of um, just practice to get good at and feel comfortable at. And unfortunately, it's nothing that anybody can teach you, you know, other than you're playing around with a simulator. So that's one reason just to start off scalping only and don't worry about the profits. You're just gaining experience in the market. And then the second thing is if you have a smaller account size, the longer that you're in the market, the longer the holding time, the more risk you have. So your initial goal when you're first starting out is to, A, just build up experience get practice in execution and learn to trust yourself that you're not going to get any huge dings and then just see how the conditions unfold day after day and as you gain an experience you might extend your holding time to perhaps being better accomplished at capturing that trend for the day and then gradually as you feel like you've built up your account size then I think it's more appropriate 
that a trader could uh, put on positions or perhaps you want to use some options and there's all different kinds of games that you can gravitate towards. So that's my approach to the market. You can see the same thing here, the little um, three bar balances looking for breakout mode or the short term sell divergences on the two period rate of change, a sell short day. This is just another little quantitative study which I'm happy to explain to you in June you know, as you wait for the other things to line up. So that's an overall synopsis as to my whole sum of my trading uh, style and methodology reduced to you in 10 minutes. Let's progress to volume though. As I said, volume was not something that we really used much 15, 20 years ago because the data was not timely. Um, so even though now I still am stuck with my basic swing trading, which is I'm, I'm acutely aware of the previous day's high and low. Those are the most important points to me, how the price trades around there. And obviously you could see with today's trading that 16, 14, 25 in the S&Ps was a viable uh, pivot, if you want to call it that, uh, to trade uh, you know, for the retest back up, et cetera. Um, still, Volume is going to be what gives us that confirmation or non-confirmation. And in my experience with this business, the whole game is keeping the ball in play. In other words, a great majority of my trades, they're not huge wins. I'm just getting that tennis ball back on the other side of the court. But what we're really waiting for is that opening where you can really tee it up and really leverage it up. And that might not happen so often, and it might not happen until you've built your account size up. But I think that once you understand the spots that you can use higher leverage and with the volume confirmation, I think that's where you will be able to graduate from um, being a proficient scalper, day trader, et cetera, whatever, to perhaps being able to put away a bit more money from trading profits. Okay, whoops, let me just go back one here. So, uh, at any rate, uh, hmm. there we go. So lastly, we're just going to look at the short-term scalpings today. And before we get to that, we're going to look at one more thing. What is the basic tone for the day? Strong money flows or consolidating trading range? Because again, if you're a market profile aficionado, you know that the market's either trending and momentum type of uh, markup period or in what we call a bracketing market. And if you don't distinguish between the two environments, it's very easy to get chopped up in a lighter volume trading range. So what I always look at, and this is just works for me, you can find your own proxy. I'm always going to look at the first 30 minutes of the NYSE volume. And yes, I know that the majority of the volume is not traded on there anymore. But I tell you guys, it works as well as anything and so uh, the best volume patterns and the best things you can do with increase and range and activity and that green light go and momentum and breakouts and so forth are going to happen when you've got this larger bar in the first 30 minutes of the NYSE volume. You can see we had three good days uh, last week before of Friday's upside breakout. And then look at today. So you know that this market was going to be unable to get legs to carry too far beyond just a test of Friday's high. Same thing with the bonds. It set the tone for the bonds. Yes, we had some downside follow through, but they didn't close on their lows. And so what I find is that the days where we're going to have that true trend day with range expansion and close in the upper 10 to 15 percent of the range or the bottom 10 to 15 percent of the range uh, tend to have bigger first 30 minute volume on the NYSE. So with that said, that's how I always put my overall day in context and the exception to that might be uh, the grains occasionally are in their own world as are the softs. Uh, but in terms of the financials, meaning the currencies and basically the metals and uh, credit instruments and, and definitely the index futures, uh, that, that's my experience. All right, so let's keep drilling down here because I want to get down to the nitty gritty so that we can have some real fun day trading here. So I like to use something that's going to alert me to unusual activity because as you know, 
traders are taking advantage of aberrations okay, or uncertainty in the market. That's what creates opportunity for us. And those types of events are going to be where there's something unusual happening. Uh, so that's my number one thing. I want to go where there's unusual volume, an unusual gap, or unusual range, or unusual volatility and activity. That's what creates the opportunity. So this started off as a little project. Um, I have a friend out in Nevada. And, and she's actually up at Lake Tahoe and uh, is uh, the girlfriend of one of our developers, but one of those very, very smart people. And she swore that she could see the, the uh, footprints of the big boys coming in and buying or selling and so forth, looking at every tick and sort of along the lines of a market delta type of modeling with the bid and the ask and, and so forth and so forth. And I said to her, I said, well, look, you know, um, <clears throat> Show me your data points. You know, we'll look through the data here, and I'll see if I can find a more efficient way of trying to harness that. And I found that 95% correlation of what she was thinking that she was seeing without the aid of a linear chart or so forth simply showed up in the same way in one-minute volume spikes. So that's how our whole little project started, modeling these one-minute volume spikes. And this is something very simple that I, I did on uh, CQG and TradeStation, and I'll show you exactly how I did it. And if you want to play around with this too, you can look at it as well. But I simply use a standard deviation function. I'll show you exactly what it looks like, just to filter out so that maybe I can see the two or three high volume spikes of the day. So I thought, well, let me just start off with this and model out like what happens five bars, 10 bars, 20 bars, 40 bars out. That's sort of how we do our modeling and see if there's any statistical significance. And maybe about, I would say, three quarters of the time, there was an expectation that you would have continuation in the direction of the price. Well, that should go without saying. So you'd think, well, why not just enter and then exit five bars later? And the reason is, is because when you do have a volume climax, a volume spike, I'm sure you've seen, you get a very sharp snapback in the opposite direction, so the losses could be quite large. So uh, you, you can't just trade on this alone is what I'm saying. Now just a word for you guys, because pretty much if you're a day trader, my experience has been that uh, I would say 95% of the people I know making money day trading are using discretion, and um, you, you're good at doing pattern recognition, and that's something that most people don't appreciate, is that humans are better at seeing patterns and putting them into a context than a computer, unless it's one of those most sophisticated computers, such as they train to eventually win at, at Jeopardy. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that show. It's absolutely, uh, totally fascinating, um, teaching a computer this rule-based, um, letting rule-based rule learning on its own. At any rate, uh, with all of you, if you're newer, the more patterns you study, the better that you get. And same thing with looking at any new way of examining data, be it market profile or uh, you know, a, a particular pattern, etc. Study it and really try and see the times that it works and the time that it doesn't work. So I'm just a big, uh, despite the fact that we like to do all this modeling and stuff, I'm a big proponent of common sense, and if it works for you, great. And if it doesn't, don't force it. There's, there's a million ways to skin a cat, and we'll look at them today. Just briefly, you can go back and review this trade later, but uh, if you want to understand the basics of volume, Gartley uh, did better than anybody else, and uh, you'll see a lot of the things that I'm going to present were actually put forth by Dick Arms. It's very hard to do something original on your own, these guys. <laughs> you know, it's like most everything was talked about 100 years ago, but at any rate, I really... Uh, thought it was interesting that Dick Arms' original book on equivolume charting was something that I had checked out of the San Francisco Business Library in 1982. And just a word about this fine gentleman, he is still producing his equivolume charts and research on stocks for institutions uh, for so many years using this basic concept that we are going to look at today on intraday data. So here's the four main patterns that we're going to review, and here's the thing. I know that you guys know these already. I know that you know them intuitively, 
and you're probably trading them. And what we're just simply going to do is put them into a context and give you confidence factor that yes, you're seeing the right thing and give you a little bit aid as to what tests out for the best money management on these patterns. Uh, so uh, again, I'm, I'm sure I'm telling you stuff that you already know. But let's start off and I'll just show you how we began the research here. Uh, this is just a, a short-term yen chart. This was a CQG uh, chart and trust me you guys, you can do this on any charting software these days. And you can see what we did is we simply put a standard deviation band, which is Bollinger Bands, with a, anywhere from a 150 to a 200 period, look back period. And you can simply filter 4.5 or 5 standard deviations depending on the sensitivity that you want. And you can set it to give you a little alert. So hey, it's time to wake up. You don't have to monitor this whole uh, dead activity since you're sleeping anyway. And the market's coming to life and we start to see this pattern of increasing volume and increasing standard deviation. All right, so that's, first of all, you want to go where the action is and tell us that a market is coming to life with volume. Now, you'd be surprised because even though I'm showing this chart here and it looks like the market's dead, here's a different session with the yen. And there was plenty of volume in the night session here. So this was actually, had been coming at the end of the swing and you can see we get a couple identifiable patterns already. The increase in volume on the breakout, and I know there are algos there. I know there are algos that go in at these little support and resistance levels, um, and I, I, I'm pretty certain exactly what they do, so we'll look at that. Uh, but you get your first push up and your pause, and then lastly, the volume climax at the top, and you'll see that almost any good uh, divergence in the volume here will also have a divergence in some type of momentum oscillator more often than not. That's when you have a volume divergence that is tradable, you will have a momentum divergence. So you can see a little bit of activity in the night market and then the change of character where there's no definite chart formation, we just start getting an alert that something is now happening to the downside, the volume is now coming into the downside and we start to see continuation patterns. So you can see this is just basic theory so far. I'm showing you different ways that you can capture this. Now we can take that volume spike and create little linear indicators uh, to give us alerts. And very easy to see that you get the volume increase on the break from the supports. And now support, remember, support always needs to be two data points. OK. Hold on one sec. Tell her I'm in the middle of something. So supports a break from two data points. The first volume breakout is always the best one. Here's another uh, support break from two data points. Boom. And then lastly, we see this so often, the three pushes, that final volume spike coming way late in the swing. And uh, that's your selling climax there. So, so far you can see that we can just note that there's uh, these, these volume spikes, but we haven't really said how to trade them or how to use them or how to even put them into a context. So we're just starting off with the foundation. This was an increase in volume, what I call a change of character, because we classified these into four basic patterns. And granted, this is very early in the morning, but it still popped up. So you have your change of character where, number one, there's no definitive chart structure. So one of the important things that you guys are all, uh, I'm sure, getting uh, very adept at, if you're not at already, when you put something into context, it's looking at the overall structure. And you can do that through market profile format or bar chart format. And structure is simply A, are we in a trend? B, are we breaking support? Uh, you know, if you're looking at structure on profile, is it pushing outside the value area or is it forming a narrow rotation? So lots of ways to skin the cat. So here's your first change in character. If you were long and you saw a change in character, you need to either tighten your stop or exit on the first reaction up. So that's your warning sign right there. And then ultimately, you can see the classic 
volume climax, which comes at the end of a swing. This is going to be very important. Pay attention because when you get these volume spikes that are not an immediate break of a support area, time to exit your position, period. It tests out so well. If you see these volume spikes that are happening when you're well at the end of the swing and not just the first break of support, exit your position. So if I'm sitting here and I happen to have a position on or I'm so lucky and I hear my little beep, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking up and, and you know, I don't even have to monitor uh, every single market and you know, all these little one minute charts. I don't look at one minute charts. I'll tell you that right off the bat. I just set the little alert and I'll show you why because it is so cool when you see the E-minis and you see exactly what amount of volume and range transpires in one minute, it's not a steady flow. You get the bulk of your move in one minute. And I think that's just with the proliferation of this broadband trading and so forth. Um, it's just going to really sharpen you up because you want to be positioned in advance for that. So your obvious retest, right? This is basic. Remember the volume divergence is accompanied by the oscillator divergence and then bingo, voila, you take out that swing high and you get the increase in volume showing change in character. All right, so enough of the theory, enough of the theory. These are just more charts showing the volume spike, climax at the end of the swing, there's no imminent uh, immediate break of resistance area, so the market's a little bit uh, long in the tooth here. And the uh, same thing here on this cell climax. Uh, you might have seen a little bear flag here. It would have been perfectly appropriate to go in and put on a short position, and it would have gotten stopped out. So I always try to make sure when I look at any data, I want to examine all the times where it didn't work as well. Obvious. Uh, upside uh, momentum, upside volume, first pullback, shallow uh, volume. So again, this is nothing new to you guys. It's just we're going to look at some different ways of looking at data. I know that uh, many of you are market profile aficionados. I took a little charting platform here, and I simply uh, plotted the uh, spread out price action with volume underneath and the, the value areas. So uh, this is just another way of seeing the retest down on, on the push outside of this early, uh, of yesterday's quote value area uh, with the volume divergence. And you're more likely to get your uh, best reversals in the morning session as opposed to the afternoon session. I really don't look for divergences in the afternoon session. Uh, but again, also the lack of volume on the test outside this area here, and, and very easy to see. So the long and short of it is there's many ways to see the same thing, many ways to format data. My job here is to show you a couple things, uh, ways of looking at it. Now this is a trade station chart, and we did the exact same thing here. We set up the volume bar here, so you can see that it took out the uh, standard deviation function, and it gives you a little paint bar or an alert if you want it. Now, what do we do with this? How do we go from here? How do we scalp? How do we trade? How do we use this to our advantage? There are several ways. The first and most aggressive way is ultimately to be positioning yourself in the direction where you can get something like this. Obviously, uh, trading in the direction of the trend is uh, one useful way, uh, putting buy stops above resistance levels, and you'll see uh, so many times how many times volume comes in right on the breach of a previous resistance or previous support type of area. Um, the first upside breakout, we find you never get more than a two to three minute pause. If you're a very aggressive adept trader and you happen not to have a position on and you happen not to have buy stops in, uh, this isn't, there's nothing wrong with scalping these things. What I look for is I do not want to see this retrace back down below the 50% point of this bar. I want that shallow sideways. I don't want a deep reaction that's going to form what might be a flag that ends up being a false breakout. So. I don't know if you're aggressive or not, um, but this is something to look at. Uh, also, uh, the ticks, I know that there's many of you uh, that are very good at tape reading the ticks. 
I put up a one minute volume, uh, char uh, one minute tick chart of them, and you can do the same thing here, by the way, using those standard deviation bands to give alerts if you get little penetrations in the ticks if you're a trade station user. Uh, I, I don't do it. I tend to just watch the uh, quote board like real old fashioned, but I thought this would be in interesting for you to see because most of the time when you get a tick by divergence, you also get a volume divergence. And you can see up here the volume divergence at the top here where we made a higher high with no volume at all and the, the same thing with the ticks, a lower high in the ticks. And if I had the little 310 oscillator up here, which I don't, you would have seen a traditional oscillator cell divergence as well. So again, lots of ways to skin a cat. But let's go on now and let's format the data slightly differently. We're going back to a basic bar chart, and we're going to have zero indicators on these charts. I just put up a one-minute CQG chart of gold, and I want to show you the difference in feel that adding volume to this uh, will we'll do. Um, this is a one-minute chart of gold, and now back to Dick Arm's equivolume charts. Remember, he originated these back in the early 80s, and it's, it's very much like a candlestick chart, except the width of the bar is adjusted for the volume. So here we see the same type of chart. Uh, we just call them candle volume charts now, and it gives an entirely different feel. Uh, so what we found is that more often than not, when you get this break here of this support level, and we actually trade these, we put in little sell stops right below and little buy stops right above, so it's not like we're trying to goose anybody out there either. It's just that this is a, sort of a, a, a give me now that you got to at least try on these, and you know maybe two out of three work out, and the third one doesn't go anywhere, and you grab it back for a small loss. I mean, that's sort of how it goes, but we found that the good ones tend to work right away, and you have no doubt about it. So uh, that's just one thing that you can watch for yourself. If you're a little bit more hesitant and newer to the trade, um, it's always nice to have some type of uh, little tool where you can put resting buy stops or sell stops out there and let the market uh, pull you in. Um, that's something that I, I don't do that often, but I've gotten better about doing it, and it's always been hard for me because I was taught uh, to be so conservative in terms of my initial trade location, which I'm sure all of you know means buying on dips and selling on rallies, and it's been very hard for me to adjust my game to to be more aggressive in breakout type of formations. So even after uh, 33 years of full-time trading, I'm always working on stuff uh, myself as well. But you can see here the difference that you would feel if you had in a sell stop here and you got pulled in, it gives you a whole lot more confidence when you see something like that come in. Just like, I don't know how many of you saw that EC break from that big old triangle this morning, and of course Draghi was speaking, and of course there's a lot of times that these are triggered by news events, but if the market pulls you in, uh, great, and if it doesn't, so be it. It's uh, on to the next uh, setup. So, increase in volume, one, two, three. Okay, so we're going to talk about this pattern a lot because it's probably one of the easier uh, patterns for people to recognize, number one, the volume divergence at the end of the three pushes. Uh, number two, you can see it on one minute, three minute, five minute, 15 minute charts, and as we'll see on daily charts, uh, such as that yield chart. So it's a very identifiable pattern that happens at the end of the swing, and it is one of the few patterns, again, that you can trail a stop on. A, a rising wedge or a descending wedge is um, one of the very few patterns that tests out where you can put on a counter trend trade and play for a bigger win. I mean, face it, most of the time, if there's uh, bear flags or even a simple buy divergence, you're playing for a regression to the mean which doesn't necessarily imply a big win. That's a small trade only, like a retrace back to the moving average. And this is about the only pattern that we can consistently come up with that when it's triggered or you're pulled into it, you can trail a stop and play for a bigger win. Um, so that's just something that you can study for yourself. 
And now that I tell you that, you're probably not going to see one for the next two weeks because that's just how it is. Sometimes the best trades seem to have a lower frequency of occurrence. Uh, but you're just going to be increasing your sensitivity to this overall because we know that after you get that first push, we're going to be monitoring the market for are we having increasing volume on the break or the decreasing volume with the divergences. And we'll also see on the flip side of the coin that green light go. And by the way, it does test out as well that when you do get these breaks of support or resistance, that that also is a pattern that you can trail a stop on as opposed to just putting in, you know, a two-point profit or et cetera, et cetera. So this is just your one little uh, one-minute chart of gold. And of course, gold down here was 1392. And where are we now? 1469. So almost $80 up from this key low. And of course, uh, I've yet to have captured uh, even 50% of one of those types of moves. But um, so be it. OK, one more example for you in the difference of feel. This is just a little one-minute chart on the end. Please keep in mind, I am not trading one-minute charts. I'm using them to make a point, OK? And the point is that here you would have had significant volume alerts. But just looking at this raw data here, how many would have felt comfortable uh, selling down on this little uh, two or three minute bar. It's a very awkward feeling because it feels like we're already so very oversold that your trade location is horrible, you know. Uh, so it, it just is not a very um, uh, compelling uh, spot to be even thinking about the downside, even though you had a break of support and all downside momentum and everything saying that the supply-demand imbalance is totally out of whack, right? OK, but now look at this data point here. This is the same data point after that first big break of this support area here. So you can see if I went, whoops, getting ahead of myself here. This area right here, this break of this area right here, now I'm breaking it right here. How many of you would have felt comfortable selling in here or even on this little reaction up? But it's a little bit more com um, palatable when you put it in the perspective of, the first thrust down on the break of support followed by looking for the one, two, three pushes. And you'd be surprised that this little one, two, three pushes happens more often than not. Okay, lastly, I'll show you the same thing on a 15-minute yen data. Okay, and here you can see the same thing. Not very compelling. How do you organize data like this? I mean, I honestly would uh, rather stick my finger in a light socket and, you know, it looks like I got zapped pretty good. There's, there's not any compelling uh, structure here other than the converging trend lines. So you have your converging trend lines, and that is a pattern that I know uh, you do have algos stepping in at that point, or of course, uh, the market's consolidated to an equilibrium level because everybody's waiting for economic data or news announcement. And this is the way that the markets move out of these points these days very abruptly. So look at it now in this context. With the increase in volume, your light volume reaction up, and you're getting your second leg down. Now here's another thing that I want all of you guys to train your eye to see. It's in the data all the time, and it's just a matter of training your eye to see it. And you can do it simply by plotting an ADX on a, on a bar chart and noting that it's dropping way down low. And I know that most of you that use market profile are aware of this intuitively as you start to form those large value areas or volume nodes or whatever terminology you want to give them. Uh, in the old days, Charles Dow just simply called them a sideways line. So you're going to get your sideways line, which is where you can draw a ruler, and the price trades back and forth through it multiple times. It will also form a big clump breakout on point and figure charts. So it's all different ways of looking at the exact same thing. Choose your poison. Pick how you want to format it. Now, the volume came into the downside when we took out this low. Remember, your two data points, I just used one, two here. And that's where you get your volume in. And we see this all the time. So here, we took out this highs, these highs over here with increase in volume. 
Here we took out this high, but we didn't get the increase in volume, and obviously we're already overextended. Here the volume came in uh, on the increase of, of this, and of course these are 15 minute charts, so the data is radically convinced, uh, condensed, but you'll see that the bulk of the move comes in a very, very brief period of time. And I'm just telling you again, algos are very aggressive in playing this game. And I know that because we've got black box and I've done black box and, and we have our own little algorithms doing and you know it's uh, putting in buys and then managing them uh, on a level that's very difficult to do with uh, human discretion. Uh, but you guys all have the luxury on our trading platforms. For example, uh, I, I know that TradeStation or Ninja or the Photon platform that I use or any of these, you can simply put in a buy stop and if it's triggered, have it trail a stop so that if price backs off 10 ticks off the high, boom, you're out. You know, simple algorithms like that, you can make them as complex, they scale out, et cetera, et cetera. And trust yourself to let the machines do some of the job of managing the trades. You might be surprised that it actually can do a better job than you if you didn't get a good night's sleep the night before. So here's a case of the beans where we had the breakout from the converging trend lines. Converging trend lines must have five data points, one, two, three, four, five, where you can draw a triangle. You always have to have five data points in traditional technical analysis. And of course, um, we started to see the increase in volume when you took out the previous highs. So this is a case where if you were trailing a stop, and here's another increase in volume on the break of those highs and so forth. Um, the best way to trail a stop once you get this green light go condition, which is where you've got this increase in volume until, of course, you had your uh, volume divergence up here at the top, little wind down to the equilibrium point, and we sort of dribbled back down below these support areas. The best tool that I've found is trailing it a couple ticks beneath the low of the big volume bars. So keep pulling your stop up beneath the low of the big volume bars because in a trending market you don't want to see those higher time frame players get whipsawed. You want to see that yeah they're right they know what they're doing they're buying this up here until the party stops and maybe they're uh, taking a little bit of profit since the beans were up 16 handles or uh, 16 cents from that breakout all right. So it's, it's uh, if you're short here you would definitely want to have a stop above the high of that bar and if you want to be super aggressive, this is not my style, but if you want to be super aggressive, you can even look to place initiating buy or sell stops um, below or on the opposite side of one of these volume bars. So just something to keep in mind. And here was an opposite case where we had a big increase in wheat and then the slow loss of momentum all at the top. There was no volume. It was all distribution. Uh, here's your, now you've got this well-defined support, these two data points. It was not very uh, enticing when it first broke because we didn't get the volume coming in to the downside. But what I wanted to show you with this chart was check out if you had a low, a sell stop beneath the low of the high volume bar. That's where everybody's break-even stop is going to be in theory, of course. So it's not a bad spot to put in a sell stop and then just see if the market gives you something. You know, maybe you're scalping two or three cents and it's just lunch money, but you never know. One out of ten trades tend to be a big win. Okay, let's go on and add a little bit more sophisticated overall structure. Like I said, I tend to be a swing trader uh, by heart. And so for me, the bulk of that is looking for the pattern in the waves. I'm also a big aficionado of traditional technical analysis. So for those of you that are familiar with uh, the writings of Dow or even Wyckoff, um, you will know that what constitutes a trend or a trend reversal is two lower highs. So there's several ways to think about this. And I'll tell you this works great, be it on one minute, five minutes, hourly data, daily data. Go and study this for yourself. So here is a simple chart of a of a net gas just looking at the intraday swings up or down. And of course we did have the little bit of a volume divergence at the top, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a sell signal per se. Uh, we, we still had a, 
a little back off and then a retest back up. But here's what I want to show you. We had one lower high and two lower highs. So at this point, now keep in mind I'm doing this without the benefit of the higher time frame structure. You know, yes, of course you can look at the hourlies. Yes, of course you can look at the dailies. But let's just start at the most primitive basic foundation and learn to read a basic chart one time frame without all the uh, you know gobbledygook indicators and without Fibonacci lines and all that other crap drawn all over it okay so let's just follow the market follow the the supply demand imbalance and follow the swings up or down that's uh, my basic philosophy so you've got one lower high now we have an ABC down nothing wrong with trading from the long side after a corrective ABC down two notes here of caution this leg was greater than this previous leg. That's a little bit of a caution if you're looking for a traditional ABC corrective uh, consolidation. You really don't want to be seeing this leg so much deeper than this leg, but that's okay. But look at the volume now on this retest up. So here's what's important. One lower high, two lower highs. A very aggressive trader will go fishing for the trend reversal off of two lower highs. It's probably your best risk reward ratio out there. It is not confirmed though until you take out this swing low. So here's where a really uh, conservative type of play might be is if you have your ABC down, the conservative play is to put in the sell stop below the low of an ABC. And I guarantee, I, I shouldn't use that word, but you can look at this yourself, that you should get a winning trade if you put in a, a sell stop below this ABC down or above the high of an ABC up. And they've got to be really clearly defined, a rhythmic type of waves. If you have to squint at the data, that's no good, okay? But the majority of the time you'll have a positive expectation trading in the direction of that breakout. So I, I first wanted to point out one lower high, two lower high, extremely important in structure, extremely important. And uh, the contraction in the volume on the way up just shows so clearly in this particular case, real lull. And then of course once the trend reversed to the downside, you've got your increase in volume light volume reaction up, greater increase in volume, light reaction up, and so forth and so forth. And then at this point you had your one, two, three type of waves down. It's not that symmetrical wedge that we were looking at, but you get the idea here. So of course no trader is going to trade something like this perfectly. But the point is, is that you might be able to capture a piece in the middle a, you shouldn't be looking for the long side at this point. You should be looking to short the rallies. And B, it should definitely help you in your tape reading abilities because this same type of rhythm or formation definitely happens in all the markets and all the time frames and so forth. So let's move on because I've just got a couple more things uh, to talk about here. Trading with consistency, with discretionary trading. You know, somebody said to me, Wow, day trading is really like playing poker. You know, you're, you're trying to keep some, uh, some pattern recognition at the back of your mind. You're trying to look at the other players for clues. Are they bluffing or are they not bluffing? You know, there's a little bit of skill there. Obviously, the more experienced you are, I think the better player that you'll be. And, and lastly, of course, it's highly dependent on money management. You know, when are you going to bet a little bit bigger? And, and when should you just know uh, to, to fold? And, and of, of course, there's a lot of different strategies with, with poker, but I think that day trading is very much like uh, poker in, in, the, in the amount of discretion that we actually do use. So the number one thing is stay in the moment. You know, you, if you're at a poker game, you're not trying to think a couple hands ahead or second guess, you're second guessing on whether somebody's bluffing or not, so forth. So just like trading, don't project. Don't see too far ahead. Yes, we have ideas of daily swing highs and daily swing lows. Yes, we have an overall idea as to structure, but we're definitely taking our cues from the market and not getting into straight line thinking. My experience is that trading is like fishing. You know, I stock the market with a bias. I'm always looking to short a rally or buy a dip 
and work the market from one side. The only exception to that is, is, is this breakout uh, type of thing from these coils, and it, it's still hard for me. If I play a guessing game, I'm very good at guessing like 95% wrong uh, most of the time. So I, I've learned to try and let the market pull me in a little bit more. I'm just not very good at guessing uh, the direction. But um, So trading's like fishing. You're always dropping your pole in. I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm monitoring the market. And I'm looking to be a buyer because the trend is up or the momentum was up on the hourlies and now we've got an hourly correction or whatever the case may be. And I, I know you can do the same thing watching your market profile areas, the, the top of the value area or the, or the bottom of the value area. You're looking at it with a certain bias to perhaps initiate one way or the other. And then you're looking for the market to give you confirmation that your bias is correct. And if it's not, if you're looking to buy a dip but all of a sudden you're seeing volume come in on the downside and it's breaking support, Whoa, stand aside, you know, um, my game plan's wrong. Uh, you know, I, I better regroup and, and assess, and now maybe my bias might be looking to, to short a reaction up and so forth. Uh, if, if the trade condition lines up, you put the trade on and manage it and then see what the market gives you, and the volume is going to tell us if we catch a big fish or not, you know. So when we get the volume and we've got it right, you caught a big fish, and that's really where uh, you, you want to stay with those trades. So I'm always looking at, 1,000 trades, 100 could be big fish. And ultimately, the larger the event, uh, the more significant the implications and so forth. Now, let's just look at a couple more charts here for fun and drill this into our heads because I could blab all day, but you know the story. A picture is worth a 1,000 words, right? So here we've got a silver short-term chart. Now, I put up three-minute charts, and my point is, is that, no, you don't need to watch three-minute or one-minute or these dinky time frames, but all I'm showing you is that there's really just two or three swings, main swings, during the day that we can take advantage of. And so they'll show up on these short time frames. And what I'm looking at is the chart formations, not necessarily like an oscillator or anything like that on, on a short time frame chart. Honestly, I mean, I, I would be a spaz, you know, if I tried to do that. It would be impossible for me. But I'm looking at the chart formation. So you'll see the same thing if you're looking at a five-minute chart or a 15-minute chart or a one-minute chart. And I'll show you the way that this will even show up um, in other volume ways or market profile type stuff. So once again, the silver, they're all going to have this same characteristic of climax at the end of the trend. Remember, a climax bar, range expansion, increase in volume at the end of a swing great spot to take profits. When you're in a trade, you must be anticipating. What is my next action? Am I tightening my stop down? Am I looking to exit on a climax bar? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, you had your reaction up on light volume, and then one, two, three pushes down. What I wanted to show you here is just remind you that this is the few pattern that can lead to a bigger win against the trend. We're in a definite strong downtrend. This is one of the very few counter trend patterns. One, one, two, three, four, five data points that you could trail a stop on. And of course, silver down at this point was 23.30. Now we're up at 24. So of course, I would have been long out, but uh, you know the point is they do make significant bottoms. Here is a crude chart, five minute time frame, similar type of chart formation. Uh, this was actually what started the, the low of the last swing to the upside. And we're going to look at this in just a couple ways because, it, like I said, there's many ways to skin a cat. So a uh, little bit of, of a downtrend going on here. Uh, the one, two, three is like, get me out. The market never reacts enough to get the trap loans out. So it's like that last gasp, and you can see the obvious volume divergence at the end here, uh, the five data points, the break of the trend line. You were lucky in that it did give you a, an extra little pause here. It may or may not. And, and again, uh, off to the races. But uh, here's another way of looking at this. This was, uh, I just put up uh, the market profile on the photon charts. I, I like to spread it out. You know, this was originally uh, based off of, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Terry Lieberman's Window Trader. So this is a, 
uh, written by the same fellow uh, with the blessings of Terry Lieberman who developed the Window Trader product. So basically the same uh, application, although uh, to Terry's uh, credit, they're constantly evolving uh, their new product. But just ingenious, ingenious market profile uh, displays that, uh, that he programmed with that window trader. So here, this is that same point. I just put up the pit session data for you because I know that some, of, some people like to look at pit session data. Some people like to look at the 24-hour. Regardless, that third push was a push outside of what was established as being the, quote, value area. So it was a push below the lower uh, value area with a dry up in volume closing at the upper end of that value area. So that's another way it looks. Now here's a traditional uh, bar chart with a momentum oscillator on it. This is actually CQG. And I like to color the bars so that they're purple when they push outside of the Keltner channels. And you'll find that this is 99% correlated to an increase in volume push outside the Kellner channels, which is an ATR function, new momentum lows on the oscillator, boom, one, two, three, I color the bars white when I start to get the dry up in the momentum. So you've just seen three different ways of looking at data there. Uh, pick your poison. Uh, here's your volume candles. Here's uh, with a little bit of a profile. Here's traditional bar chart with oscillator. I think in the long run you'll do best if you just focus on one or maybe one or two methods and you can't sit there and do this with 15 different markets at once. You need to specialize in doing one thing and doing it well. So let's go back and let's just look at that low right here on the candle volume charts and see how that ended up playing out if we just scroll forward. So that low was right here. I'll tell you two little tricks, okay? Just think about conceptually uh, don't get you know, don't get so hung up on the little time frames, the little five minutes and the oscillators and this and that. Far more important to think of what is going on conceptually. What is the market telling us? You just saw an expiry of the volume to the downside with a climax flush, yada, 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 yada. Okay, put it in a context. And that was this low right here. A little bit of volume coming into the upside. But that's okay because all of you know that this is a relatively quiet uh, time for crude to be trading here. But still, think about what I said. We've got one higher low and now two higher lows. All right, so we definitely have the short-term trend reversal confirming this after our descending wedge. And then the acceleration in the trend was accompanied by increase in volume and even more increase in volume the shallow volume on the retrace, and even more increase in volume. So my point being, if one was so blessed with more of a trend following uh, background or felt more comfortable trailing stops, uh, you, if you were trailing an average true range function or a, a million different ways to trail stops, you would probably uh, have been in this trade uh, still to the close on this chart. And of course, we know that this might only be one out of every 10 trades. And I'm lucky if I manage to capture one of these, you know, once every four weeks. So uh, really, if I make 50 trades, I might capture uh, something like this and, and, and get a partial there. So, uh, you know, it's one thing to know the theory, right? And it's a totally different thing to put it into practice. And a lot of that's going to depend on your individual temperament, and your individual organizational skills and uh, a host of factors. And all I can say is never beat yourself up for uh, once you're out of a trade. Don't ever look back. I've made every mistake in the book and just keep plugging away and looking for the next trade. And hopefully some of these volume things will give you new ideas or new energy to keep doing your own research in the future. Okay, let's check out this bond chart because I wanted to show you two more things. <laughs> very important time of day functions in our modeling. And I know I've been talking for almost an hour here, so we don't have a whole lot more to go. But I wanted to show you how important these time of day functions are. And I'm in Chicago, so I'm in the central time zone. So most of my references are going to be to central time zone. 
I use the 7 a.m. reading for everything. Yep, even the S&Ps, and I'm going to show you why. So here the bonds started, uh, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with that open drive concept that was referred to in Jim Dalton's book on, on uh, market profile and price behavior. Open drive is a very, very powerful concept in that you open up and you never really trade below the opening price, just like we had in the pit session S&P a couple times in the last uh, week. So here was on our 7 a.m. reading and immediately saw the volume come in, the range come in, taking out resistance area previous highs and a pretty steady trend up. Now, don't get hung up just because there's a big bar here because there's nothing in the price structure that would support a climax selling or, or a distribution top or anything like that. What I wanted to draw your attention to, other than the obvious fact that we made a higher high on lighter volume, but like Duh. Okay. What I wanted to draw your attention to was the way after we have a large standard deviation move or a trend move, we have to go back to find that equilibrium level, which is going to show itself in the formation of a sideways line before we can reverse in the opposite direction. And of course, we did do a little bit more trading on here before we broke to the downside again last Friday. But it's always a process. So let me show you some really cool testing here. Um, this is, we tried to model the time of day uh, that you would see the, the frequency of the highs or the lows most. Okay, And we started off looking at five-minute data in the S&P on the pit session. And wow, it was so obvious. On trend days up, the low would come in the first 30 minutes of trading, and on trend days down, the high would always come in the first 15 minutes of trading. And, and those were the most frequent periods that the highs or lows were made for the day in general, even, of course, though we do have a lot of rotational days as well. So I was like, well, hey, you know, if we can do that with the S&Ps, let's just do it on every market out there, and we can do this 24 hours. And boy, if I knew there's lows or highs coming at 3 a.m. in the morning, darn, I'm going to be up and ready for that one, right? Sounds so easy. So, of course, we ground out all these numbers and came up with zero, zippo, nothing of statistical significance. And this is the way it goes with like 95% of my modeling. You know, I'm just finding grains of sand that uh, couldn't even build one mortar brick. So we then looked at, I'm like, okay, you know, I know I see these things in the data. There's got to be something here. So we broke the day up into the session openings. So think about it. When do the higher time frame players step in more often than not on the open or the close? And so we looked at Asia opening, Europe opening. I used 7 a.m. for the start time in the U.S. session because, A, it was significant time in Europe, and, B, we were so used to the bonds immediately starting to trade at 7.20 in the old pit days. And, of course, all the hedge fund people and mutual fund people in New York sit down at their desks at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I am sure that many of you remember four or five years ago the absolute goosing that we would start to see in the metals, the gold and the silver and the crude, right at 7 a.m., a very significant time of days. And then we found at the end of the morning session, surprise, Europe closed. You're getting the increase in volume and the increase in the, like the, the, the dying out of the morning trend at Europe closed. So that also proved to be a significant point. So check out these data points. This was right around, uh, right as Europe's getting ready to open. This is our 7 a.m. reading right here. Okay, this is our 12, 12 uh, just after 12 noon uh, central time, and then Asia opening. And this is so prominent in the data. Not only that, check out the lows, exact same things. So your opportunities are coming around the opening of Asia session, around the opening of Europe session, and around that 7 a.m. time frame in the S&Ps. 
Lastly, don't get caught holding the bag when the music stops at the end of your obsession. And of course now, since everybody is wise on to this, you start to see a little bit of flattening out half an hour before or initiating in the opposite direction 30 minutes before your closes. So uh, just check this out too with the S&Ps. I just thought that this was so pronounced how many times the highs or lows for the S&Ps tend to be made on that Asian opening time and how many times too we see the highs or lows for the day made or at least at least for this period going forward in the morning session at 7 a.m. So be aware of that even though the pit session does not start till an hour and a half later. So just for fun, to wrap this up, I just wanted to show just I, one minute data, just to, just to sit there and drill down to this stuff. And I do have to repeat again, I do not watch one minute charts. I just wanted to make some points that will be valid, whether you're looking at one minute, three minute, five minute, or simple market profile stuff, or, or watching the short term swings, which is just basic tape reading. The first point is, even in the AM session, this is, is our, our, our 7 AM opening, how much of the bars come in these just one minute periods? You can get some big markups. Big range, big volume at the end of the swing. Differentiate between this pattern versus the increase in volume that comes when you take out a previous swing high or resistance level. You got that? So differentiate between Late in the swing, after we've had many bars up, okay, sell stop right below there. If you want to be aggressive in initiating, definitely exit on these things. You can always get a chance to buy back if you're so uh, thrilled with the long side. Um, next, I just thought that you would be curious to see what last Friday looked like on one minute candle volumes and how much of that markup after that number was transpired in a one minute data period. So almost 10 handles unfolded in one minute. So you know that the marketplace was ready for that breakout. Everybody was watching that same movie. Uh, okay, there's our first little two minute pause. Remember the biggest bars are the ones that you can get away with and I would not want to see it retraced back to that 50% level of that bar. You just get a one or two minute pause only. Otherwise, you're stuck waiting for that first little bit of consolidation on the five minute. Again, check out the volume that comes in when we take out the highs there. So this is, uh, this is just um, nothing earth shattering on this chart that you don't already know. I just thought it would be fun to see what last Friday looked like. And again, to emphasize that the S&Ps have this pattern more than any other market. You know, we've, we found in our data, and I'm actually going to publish a little report on this. Uh, you can just sign my website and I'll, I'll show it to you. Which markets model out the most where on the lows you get spikes in the volume, such as, for example, the Canadian dollar tends to do that far more often make these little radical lows and highs on spikes in the volume, whereas other markets, such as the Australian dollar, it is going to be uh, looking more for that little volume divergence with the classic oscillator divergence and so forth and so forth. But the S&Ps do tend to have a proliferation, especially in the morning session. Remember that. I like counter trend trades in the morning session. I am not a fan of uh, counter trend trades in the afternoon session unless you have a lot of uh, backing uh, evidence such as um, you know light volume and, and so forth and so forth. So at any rate, uh, just one or two more charts here. This was the, uh, the upside breakout of that volume bar. Remember I told you, it's, if you want to have some fun, just you know looking for like little, little short term uh, things, you know, uh, these are not bad areas to frame out some type of structure, okay, just these extremes. And note again how much of the volume comes in over just a one minute period. So boom, and then blah, 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 you know, boom, and then blah, 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 you know, retest up with no volume. Okay, yeah, 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 we know that pattern by now. And blah, 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 forever. And then buy stop above there, boom. And then, you know, our, our little dribble up. So uh, 
again, look at that for yourself. The point being is that you, it's, it, think about positioning yourself for this. Think about if you are a retracement trader and can get in on these little consolidations, you want to see if we get that push up in volume. You know, let's see if we can go get some push up in volume. Let's see. Uh, lastly, this is a 15 minute chart. This really works on any time frame, just the basics, just the basics. Support and resistance, two data points. See the increase in volume on the support or resistance and so forth. Um, so pick your poison, pick your, your tools that you want to frame stuff out. Uh, you see my approach. I like the swing highs and swing lows. I like looking for confirmation either with increase in volume or the non-confirmation, which is decrease in volume and or decrease. You can see the same thing in an oscillator. Uh, the overall volume sets the tone for the day. Uh, pretty straightforward. And maybe uh, once in a while when I've got these converging trend lines here, and by the way, I do trade all the grains and, and all these markets, I've found that nothing changes. Data is data. It really doesn't matter what the market is. Is uh, there's just little subtle nuances between them. Time of day functionality uh, is important. Uh, just once you get the breakouts from the converging trend lines, if you see increase in volume, you caught a fish. Press it because that's really where your profits are going to come from. I can't emphasize that enough. Your biggest profits are going to come from hanging on to that fish, and volume's going to tell you that you caught a fish. And it's only going to happen a small percentage of the time, but when you catch a fish, hang on to it and then wait for the volume divergence or an extreme climax where you can put an offer out there and, and see if you can sell into that. So um, let's see. Just I've got one more chart here. Just I wanted to show you something funky, all right? This is why you didn't really see any indicators on my charts. Not that. I don't love them. I do. I do for all my daily work, uh, my little two-period rate of change and that, that 310 oscillator. But when you have the volume charts, these volume candle charts, there's one, two, three pushes up. You don't need to have all this stuff at the bottom of your charts. It really doesn't add anything. Uh, I think that the volume bars highlight what's there in the first place. And remember, you just want to be trailing your stop up beneath the low of these bars, pull it up until you feel there was a climax get out. One or the other is going to take you out. You're either going to exit on some climax or the market's going to take you out on a reversal. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. So let me, uh, I've got plenty of time for questions. My whole purpose of this talk was just to simply introduce different ways of looking at volume because I know that there's so much attention with uh, you know, the volume divergences and market profile and, and, and even the fact that we have all these traditional uh, tools now available on uh, the electronic uh, charting software platforms. Uh, you, can, you can plot the uh, volume, uh, you know, profiles. You, you can plot volume on, underneath a bar chart where it's, the bars are overlaid on top of the volume. I know that the Thinkorswim platform does that. And, uh, you know, the easiest patterns to recognize are often those volume divergences after the three pushes. Put the trade on and see what it gives you. Manage it. Okay. The other uh, three volumes that, uh, patterns that we talked about was the breakout from support or resistance. I mean, serious guys, we're talking first grade here. It's not. Uh, it's not complicated stuff. It's. Uh, it's. It's just basic uh, supplemental type of scalping here or confirmation that you, your, your existing position is working. Okay, so break out from support or resistance. After you get that first bar, a big volume bar and a breakout, then you've got your small continuation pause, which should always be on light volume. It's either going to lead to one more push and a divergence, but more often than not, you'll get the three pushes in the wedge, or you'll get that green light go where we continue to see increasing volume like I showed you on that crude chart and the soybean chart. And then lastly, the volume climax at the end of a swing. It may or may not set up an initiating position. For an initiating position, I like to see two things. A, some type of test or retest down, and then B, increase in volume in the opposite direction. So that's what I call 
change of character, no obvious chart structure other than the fact that you had a retest and now volume coming in the opposite direction. So break out from support or resistance, your first continuation pattern, the volume divergences that will form on those wedges, and then lastly, be aware that these selling or buying climaxes, especially in the E-minis, are, are, are wonderful places to exit if you are so blessed to have held a position for that long. And, you know, just keep in mind, uh, none of us do it perfectly. You know, maybe I only do it according to theory 10% of the time, but at least it increases my awareness of it constantly. And that's my job, is to constantly increase my awareness of my own uh, weaknesses and bring new things to keep it fresh and interesting uh, and, and always find new things to do research on. So my, my latest research, I've got these two interns coming over from uh, France who are financial quantitative type of guys and I had to give them some project to uh, model. So uh, that's what I'm going to be sending out the research on. Uh, if you sign on my, my guest book, I'll send you a little report. If you're interested in the uh, photon volume charts, Oh, by the way, I didn't mention you can you can place your orders, buy and sell on these charts. I, I think a, a number of platforms have the ability to do that now. You know, uh, just one mouse click and then drag your levels up or down. Some people are better at visually processing the spatial relationships in a chart. Other people are better dealing with statistical type of information. Uh, everybody processes information in different ways. So uh, whatever works out best for you. Uh, again, I use the, the Photon platform. Please feel free to uh, send me questions as well. And thank you again to Big Mike's Forum. I hope that I get to see many of you again in June so I can elaborate a little bit more on uh, the influence that the Taylor trading technique had on my entire career, uh, determining the trend for the day and this two to three day uh, swing trading rhythm and of course all the accompanying statistics that we did uh, to model that out. And now I've got all the time in the world to answer questions. So, uh, okay. let's well, see here. Linda, I, I guess I've got this huge list. Yeah, so uh, guys, go ahead and start typing your questions if you have them. And Linda, uh, fantastic presentation. Absolutely a gold mine. I'm sure that it'll be very popular and a lot of people are going to want to rewatch this one several times. Uh, just a quick note on the June webinar. So for those that don't know, June is the BMT four-year anniversary. So we have, actually right now, we have 18 uh, very special webinars planned, and Linda is one of those. So I'll uh, be sending out more info on that soon. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these questions. And just a reminder, everybody, after the questions are done, we're going to give away five autograph books, so uh, stay tuned for that. Okay. Woohoo! Uh, yes, autograph. All you got to do is tell me what you want me to sign, like congratulations to the best trader in the whole universe, and I'll <laughs> send that to you with my blessing. You know, <laughs> so do stick around because I, I can whip through these questions. I love answering questions. Somebody asked about the Bollinger Band settings on a two-minute yen chart on CQG. Uh, just so you know, on my bar chart data, I always use Keltner channels. I like average true range functions for our modeling on the price data. But a nifty little trick is using Bollinger Bands on the, uh, the, the volume at the bottom, or like, like I mentioned with the ticks, if you like to watch ticks for day trading, uh, the S&Ps, you can put Bollinger Bands around the ticks and always put a very long moving average, like it's 150 or 200 period look back period, so it smooths it. So it's, it's really, we just want to catch those outliers. And you can play around with this for the tick data. It might be dependent on, uh, you know, one or two minute, but play around with it, maybe two uh, standard deviations. And, and with these volume uh, spikes that we talked about, I use 4.5 to 5 standard deviations. And then that allows me to actually uh, be able to model this out on a more quantitative orientation. So if you do see an oscillator on those CQG charts as well that has like these funky little red and green histograms, that's simply the difference between a 3 and 10 period simple moving average. It's something I've used for 30 years. I started off using it when I used to get these charts called Security Market Research published by a company out of Boulder, Colorado. And uh, so it just happens to be my oscillator of choice because I've used it, but 
quite honestly, you could use a, a stochastic with a, you know, a, a, and it'll do just fine. Okay, okay the equivolume volume charts, that is, hello? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yep. Oh, okay, I was just going to say, uh, the equivolume charts are something new uh, on the uh, photon trading platform. Uh, honestly, I I'm not familiar with uh, all the different, um, uh, you know, charting modules in, in different platforms and stuff like that. I just think it's a very cool way of displaying the data. And uh, I know I saw it first from Dick Arms like 30 years ago with his book Equivolume Charting. Uh, to me, I love it just because it gives a whole different feel. Uh, and I'll look at it more for um, just like you're looking at a road map when you're driving down the road and you want to see the signs. I can't sit there and watch 16 different charts at once. But if I have a position on or I'm looking to initiate a position and I just sort of want to hone in and see if, if there's a chart formation that's forming or perhaps a volume divergence or, uh, or you know, or looking for a, a nice little scalping pattern, I might hone in on one market where I start to get that uh, alert to activity levels. Um, and like I said, you can program little beeps you know, on CQG or TradeStation or, or most of these things. You can program little price alerts just to, to wake you up too and say, hey, maybe it's time to start uh, focusing in on a chart. It looks like the big boys are stepping in here. So um, I think it, it, uh, on the last slide, if you want more information, you can, you can get that. Okay, I don't appear to use EMAs like 20 EMA for bias or trading. Any reason for that and how do I determine the trend bias? Well, honestly, I love the 20 period EMA. Uh, that's my uh, main, um, you know, main, main thing that you'll see on all my charts, the 20 period EMA with the Keltner channels 2.5 centered around them. That's just my way of sort of putting some structure on the overall price, you know, in terms of significance if the price is above or below the EMA. Once again, what time frame are you trading in short-term noise? It's going to whip back and forth through the EMA, uh, you know, if it's the short-term noise. If you're on a much higher time frame, you get a steadier degree of trendiness. Uh, also, keep in mind, you know, what I'm really looking for is what is the trend for the day? So I'm looking at where is the price relative to that 7 a.m. reading or even that first first 30 minute or hour um, bar. Are we trading above that or below that? And if there's a decrease in volume, perhaps we might gravitate back towards that 7 a.m. reading, just a very common market profile type of concept, reversion back to the mean. Um, but if there's a really strong trend in everything off that 7 a.m. reading, I'm a big believer in relative strength as well. I'll usually look to uh, trade the, the strongest from the long side and uh, and trade the weakest from the short side. So uh, that's just another way I'll get my bias to date. The sugar and, and the coffee had the, uh, the strongest relative strength readings and the uh, wheat actually had the weakest. Uh, so, but today wasn't a day to, t to play the relative strength game. In fact, you almost could have done the opposite, but I, I wouldn't recommend that. But it wasn't a good day to do the relative strength game because of the contraction in volume. So remember what I said about looking at the overall tone for the day are there strong global money flows, or is it a rotation, lighter volume trading range day? Uh, so just to repeat myself. Um, so what are my usual trade lengths and charts that I look at the most? I'll tell you guys what I try to do is I always try to keep the daily charts in mind first. And I just know that the choice daily chart formations don't set up that often. So I divide my program into three parts. I have my long-term breakouts from the chart formations or, uh, uh, you know, if, if I see something compelling, a huge momentum divergence on the weekly charts, uh, they just don't happen that often. Or perhaps I love, I love on the daily charts when you get these bear traps or these bull traps, like think of them as false breakouts of big old rectangles and so forth. They just don't happen that often. But that's my program one. And I might put on a daily position or trade with a daily bias off of that chart that could last anywhere from one week to five weeks. I find that the higher time frame that I go out to, the lower my win-loss ratio. Just like any trend-following system, your win-loss ratio is going to start to drop down. But I also find that that's where my biggest win comes from. 
So that's one game. And then my second game is sort of my in one day, out the next day. Uh, volatility breakout systems um, are a great way to uh, familiarize yourself with this type of rhythm. Even though I, I've traded them in the past and they drive me crazy and I don't like trading them, but they always have a positive edge. Um, the Taylor stuff that I do with the two-peer rate of change, which I'm happy to discuss in June for you, uh, holding time of anywhere from one to three days. Um, for example, uh, bonds would have been hold them short from Friday, uh, cover them today on the flush below yesterday's or Friday's low. That's all uh, Taylor stuff for you there. Um, and then lastly, uh, I have fun scalping. I love my scalping game with the s and I've, I've traded the s and since the very first day they were listed. That's the big contract. I traded them on the very first day they listed, and I've, I've probably traded them every week since, if not every day. And um, it, to me, I, just, I, I like to just go and make two or three scalps a day. It's the one market that I usually don't hold uh, positions on overnight because I like to free it up just for my scalping game. And, and I like to go in and have fun with, with stuff like this. I mean, um, you know, otherwise it would be boring. I, I like looking at the data and I like looking at the charts. It's, I hate to say it, it's really a sick addiction, like, you know, watching the TV or something. It's just there's always stuff, interesting thing happening and interesting patterns unfolding. And, you know, I think over time you start to see some of the same patterns repeat themselves and get a little bit more confidence in them. So that's, that's my style. Um, I don't, somebody's asked how George Douglas Taylor ended up. Honestly, I don't know. Maybe he ended up in an insane asylum trying to read his own work. I don't know. But I do have a great respect for uh, the stuff that he did put out there. So uh, the volume, you know, do I use volume or any other technical clues to differentiate a trend day versus a range bound day as close to the open as possible? Like I said, I love that 7 a.m. reading and I love looking at the DAX. I'm a huge uh, proponent of studying that DAX when I first come in, 6.30 in the morning, 7, and I will trade the S&Ps off the DAX patterns. So that's what I do. Um, in terms of clues for a trend day, honestly, if you see the money flows in the European session and the increase in volume over there, pretty good odds you'll have an increase in volume in our session. If you've got a contraction rotation light volume, and this is, of course, barring any large economic numbers or unique reports like ECB or whatever. Um, then you'll pretty much, it'll set the tone for today. So you could see uh, the DAX definitely needed more price equals time, if you want to call it that, um, consolidating the big markup that it had, you know, perhaps a little bit more consolidation towards that 60-minute EMA and so forth before it, it goes for a better retest up. So... Um, I'll tell you what, there, I, I love trend days and I love the day after trend day and I first proposed to Mike to do a, uh, a webinar on, on trend days and then Z days as I call them, the day after a trend day because uh, there's so many classic, classic patterns uh, that we can learn from there. So I'm happy to do a whole presentation on that if, if you would like at some point in the future. Um, for a new trader using a naked chart still working towards profitability, would your recommendation be to simply add the volume bars? Um, well, two things. I do think that those volume divergences are one of the more obvious chart formations because they give you an exceptional uh, risk point. In other words, if I start to see that three pushes down in that wedge, I have an absolute low that I know that I do not want that market to take out. So. You can use a pretty tight risk, whereas sometimes with the simple continuation patterns, a flag, you know, how much room do you give it? Is the flag going to turn into an ABC? Is it going to turn into a rounding top? It's a little bit more nebulous, unless, of course, it was preceded by that good volume. So if you're starting out, the number one thing I would say is, you know, just pick one or two tools. Don't clutter up your charts with too much stuff. That's an easy way to get brain fry. 
And what I would recommend is take a pencil and paper and just learn to draw out the swings as the price unfolds and, and do something active because the learning will take part in a different process of the brain than just sitting and watching the charts like you're watching TV. So I used to, to write down the tick readings and I'd take uh, readings of the breadth. Uh, you know, every five or ten minutes and, and take advantage of some of the market internals such as the VIX and RVX and so forth. Uh, so that's what I would recommend as starting out. Um, okay, uh, I read your readings on the CME where you're focused on long-term market profile charts. Didn't share that with us today. Another time? Yeah, absolutely, guys. I, I love this stuff. And, and you know what I've found is like when I share stuff with you, you guys end up coming back and saying, hey, I looked at that, but I knew I, I found this little twist on it and stuff. So sometimes, you know, they say the teacher learns more than the students, and that is always the case with me. But I'm happy to do uh, longer term works with the profiles as well. Uh, at one time, use lots of volume profile information and monkey bars on TOS, think or swim. Do I use them? Okay, I have to let you guys in on a little secret with those monkey bars on that Think or Swim platform. Uh, actually, I, I don't use that platform because uh, for futures, I, I use, um, I, I actually use the uh, Photon Trader. Uh, although Think or Swim is, is fabulous for options trading, I highly recommend them for options trading. But I'll let you in on a little secret with those monkey bars. That was my husband that invented those. Yep. Uh, so I, I had to eat, eat monkey bars for a dinner topic conversation there for a number of nights in a row. And, and Damon Pavlatos is my husband. And he's actually the, uh, the CEO of uh, Future Path. Uh, so he used to do my execution in the pits uh, back in 1992. And he started this firm with, I don't know if you're familiar with Steve Schuler, who started GetGo, um, specializing in high frequency trading and, and more professionals and that was sort of the evolution of the platform and, and, and now of course it's, it's available to anybody and I'm sure the rates are competitive with anywhere you go if you were interested in, in looking at it. But credit to those monkey bars is uh, Damon Pavlato's work and uh, of course he's given his input on all these uh, charts as well. Okay. I have a strategy on a four day ATR function but I can't find anything to help automate it, ah, boy, ah, that's, a, that's a tricky one. If you want a purely automated 100% platform, I would say uh, TradeStation is a very accessible tool to do your uh, research off of. Uh, so um, at, at any rate, you could, you could go down that route. Uh, I love TradeStation for all our uh, all modeling. Okay, some of these other questions. How do you deal with the opening volume in stocks, which is most of the time very high and therefore can fool volume filters like the standard deviation? Man, oh man, oh man, you guys want a whole other webinar on that, don't you? Well, let me tell you again, with the TradeStation, uh, which I use for the stocks, doing all my radar scan work there, uh, I keep a database of 300 shares, and I love relative strength. And I love sorting by largest bars in the first 15 minutes or largest 15 minute volume with a look back of 10 days. So do it relative unto itself. If you're going to compare the 15 minute opening session, compare it to previous 15 opening minute sessions. Don't compare it to the to the same to different time uh, sessions, if that makes sense. Always look at the 8:30 to 8:45 session reading compared to previous 8:30 to 8:45 session readings. That's the best uh, uh, reading uh, or advice I can give you on that one. Um, does the 7 a.m. reading working on crude and gold? Yes, it's Central Time, and yes, I found it works pretty well in just about any market. Put it this way: you have to pick something. It's not a perfect tool, but it works uh, more often than not. And, you know, that's what we just want is something to give us some guidelines, you know, guidelines not to, to fight those open drives that are such strong momentum when you do happen to get a crazy move off of that. Uh, how many ticks do you consider to be a scalp on the S&Ps? 
hell, one tick's a scalp, you know. I mean, <laughs> you know, as long as it's not a big negative 20 tick reading, I don't care what it is, you know. It's really a function of the market's uh, volatility, guys. I mean, you know, sometimes it's just not giving you anything. Sometimes you got in and you thought that it might to be able to do a full retest up four points, and if it starts stalling out and not doing what you think, you know, and you can get out with one tick, what the heck, you know, if you saw a dollar on the sidewalk when you're walking down the street, would you pick it up? Heck yeah. Now with that said, you don't want to make it your game plan to scout for one tick, because what's going to happen is you're going to get banged for eight ticks every once in a while, you know? You just, you know, either there will be execution errors or an adverse event or something. So it's like, no, we don't want to set that as our target or objective, but hey, I'm not too proud to say I've taken a tick out of the E-minis. <laughs> so anyway, you'll, you'll know the good trades. You know when you caught a big fish, you will, uh, you will know right away. Okay, so uh, let's see. What do I mean by trading the S&Ps off the DAX? Simple. Look at the 5 and 15 minute chart formations on the DAX when you sit down at your desk early in the morning for the S&Ps. If you see a buy divergence on that five minute DAX, you'll see the S&Ps pop with that DAX. If you have a consolidation bear flag or bull flag with the DAX, you will see the same thing on the S&Ps. Now what chart formation did the DAX have this morning coming in? It didn't. It was in its consolidation mode and it was doing what I call a bad hair day. Now this is the Z day. This is the day following a trend day, and this is why it's so important to put things in context. On the day following a big trend day, in the morning session, the tests up and the tests down are very spiky, and if you're not careful, they'll look like little mini bull flags or they'll look like mini bear flags on a five-minute chart, and they are not. It's just a testing rotation mode. And, you know, you don't want to get caught up thinking that you've got flags or continuation patterns in a light volume market. It's just whippy tests that mean nothing. And this is where if you're particularly attuned to the market profile concepts of forming a value area or a rotation type of narrow range day, uh, it might be helpful for keeping you out of trouble into reading too much into the short-term uh, patterns. But normally with the DAX, normally you can see some type of dominant technical, as I call it, on like a 15 or a 30 or an hourly chart. You know, I'm looking for those compelling uh, buy or sell divergences uh, because I think that, that, that so often we tend to follow Europe, not because Europe is a great bastion of economic growth, but it's just the fact that the global money supplies really start with the opening of Asia, and so it just filters over into our session. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding Peter Stolomeyer's belief that we are moving away from price-based order entry and instead moving towards volume-based order entry. You obviously appear to be heading in that direction. How far does volume orientation take us? This is a good question because price is always first and foremost. Like I said, volume adds the green light go. It adds the confirmation, non-confirmation. If you're entering after you get that volume thrust, of course, you've got confirmation at your back in sacrifice for trade location. So always remember that there's a trade-off between confirmation versus trade location. If you're entering on those little momentum divergences uh, at the bottoms, we're entering with superior trade location, but we don't have the confirmation yet. So it's all a balancing act and a matter of styles. And I will always be a price-based trader number one. Uh, I can tell you the price that stuff traded at years ago. I, I can tell you there are distortions in the volume just because you have multiple products. You've got the spiders and the equity options, distortions with options expiration. You know, like I mentioned to you, you need to have several things to put that volume in the context, including time of day, so we get our volume uh, coming in on the opening, of course, and you can get volume surges or loss of volume 
as we go into Europe close. So you've got very strong time of day functions there. Everybody knows the sweet spot is the middle of that morning trend. Everybody's wise onto that now. That only took them four years to figure out, okay? Uh, but, 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 you know, a sarcasm aside, uh, put stuff in a context. You know, very often, how many times do we see a volume spike on news, all right? So news is an excellent time to assess, okay, is this a spot where uh, we want to capitalize and take profits, or is it just an initiating type of news, such as we had on, uh, on uh, Friday, you know, serving as a trigger to a uh, higher time frame structure. So always uh, ask your questions. There's no perfect answer. Uh, you know, my uh, response is manage it the best you can at the time. There's no crime in doing anything except letting a big loss get out of hand. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's my thing. Keep it simple, too. I mean, we get, we get overkill with some of this stuff, and, and I get brain fry real fast. All right. Uh, let's see here. How many hours per day do I trade typically? Some believe traders are only at their best for a couple hours. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to uh, agree that uh, I'll have a higher percentage of unforced errors in the afternoon session uh, as well. Um, but with that said, there is opportunity in the last hour. In fact, uh, Damon, my husband, used to execute uh, for the Ridex fund and these large mutual funds down in the S&P pit. And, you know, they have their order and balances, and they have to establish their positions, you know, for balancing out the funds and so forth in the last 30 minutes of the day, sometimes the last 15 minutes of the day. And uh, he's very prolific at reading the volume characteristics uh, and, and uh, putting in a scalp in that last 30 minutes of trading, uh, looking as to whether the funds are going to come in and buy or sell and how they're going to time it. Are they going to try to do it uh, 20 minutes before the close or are they more inclined to wait uh, for the last five minutes of the close? That's, that's really his specialty. So know yourself and your own time of day. Um, I think the opportunities in the morning session, but with that said, I do have a, a lot of patterns that I trade where I either enter uh, on the close or I actually I wait till the evening session. I do initiate uh, positions uh, in the evening session. So um, uh, with Asia opening, and, and you can see why as well with the uh, tendency uh, with the time of day functions. So um, you know, know yourself. Uh, scalping the S and P's, I definitely do best in the morning, and and uh, no doubt about it. Um, Somebody wants to know if I have a trade room with the Photon platform. Uh, I don't really have a trade room with the Photon platform per se, but we, we do have like a small little uh, kind of chat room type of thing, trading room. And uh, we, we do, what we do is we show our trades off the charts. We've been uh, doing that with the Photon charts, getting them going where we can uh, show our fills and, and the... Uh, exits and entries on them, and uh, our developer just uh, got this all coded again in uh, C-sharp. We, we moved the uh, coding on them from um, uh, the ActiveX type of format, if you're a programmer, to the, to the C-sharp, so uh, that actually bogged us down a little bit for the last month. But yeah, we, we do, and uh, I've, I've had the room closed to, uh, to uh, uh, trials and, and uh, new people just because I, I uh, didn't want to uh, feel like uh, there would be disruptions while we were uh, getting this coding back up. And it's pretty much stable. If you're interested, you can uh, send an email. I, you know, I'm not the one to market or advertise this stuff. Honestly, it's, it's, it's just as much for my own self just to keep myself and my game, uh, the pressure on me uh, to, to stray, stray, ah, stay straight and and, you know, you call what I see instead of projecting and so forth, you know. Uh, so at any rate, uh, we, we still have the room closed for another week. But, um, yeah, there's like a little small room where we, we put a video up of the photon charts. We, we just got that up and we were able just to add audio uh, two to three weeks ago. So it's something that I've had for 13 years but never really had uh, 
the audio capability. So I'm learning to pat my head and rub my stomach at the same time here. C sharp rewrite implies that you have locked your software to Microsoft. Is this right? Uh, basically, I would assume so. Uh, I know that our execution platform is written in .NET, and uh, so it makes it pretty easy to uh, write to the API any types of modules. Um, but I'll tell you, you're speaking a different language now. Uh, you know, I'm just the one that writes the checks to do some of the programming. Uh, I'm not the programmer. What are some good books to read for a newbie? That is an excellent question. I do have some on uh, on my uh, home page uh, under resources. I believe there's some recommended reading list. Uh, personally, I think it's important just to get a solid foundation in, in chart formations for number one. And for that, I would recommend either Schabacher, uh, which wrote a, a fabulous book back in the 1930s, or else um, uh, Jeepers. Um, uh, Edwards and McGee. Edwards and McGee. Nobody knows that, that uh, Edwards was actually Schabacher's nephew, something along those lines. Uh, so that'll serve you as well as anything, just to give you a basic good start. And then, you know, I'm all for doing your own, uh, your own learning. One of the things that I did when I was starting out is, uh, of course, I didn't even have trading uh, software for the first 10 years. I just kind of sketch everything out by hand and make my own notes as to time of day functions and so forth. But then the very first time that I had a charting platform, I used to just print out a five-minute chart of the S&Ps at the end of the day. And at the bottom, I would have the ticks plotted, and I would have breadth plotted, and I would have uh, breadth, meaning the advancing, declining stuff, and I would plot an oscillator or something like that, and then just go back through inspection and just kind of circle some of the clues to look for at the turning points. So I think that that's a, as good an approach as any. And then the rest of the stuff is good inspirational reading, in my opinion. You know, you read the Market Wizards book, and here's like so many different talented people out there, and oh my goodness, they all had a million different ways of doing things and looking at data. And you know, one of the things that I can say to the newbies is that, you know, it's not that we're uh, we have IQs of 90. We all are, you know, IQs of better than 100, and you know, I like to think that we're pretty good at, at reading and digesting information and so forth. And I found that the thing that really takes a long time on the learning curve for newbies isn't just looking at the data and understanding the basics of technical analysis and so forth. A lot of it's trying different things and ultimately finding out what works for you. And this, this can be a process that could take up to three years. You know, I've seen people try spread trading, try seasonals, try S&P scalping, try market profile. You know, try this, try that. It's important to try all these things. You never want to think that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, you know. So, so give it a chance. And then, of course, you can't really evaluate any method until you've at least tried it for, you know, a couple months and can see if you can get some consistency. Can you sleep at night? Is it doing anything for you or not? So that seems to be really what takes up a, a, a good part of the learning curve. And then once you do find something that you feel real comfortable with, um, then, my goodness, you, you know, you've got to see bull markets and bear markets and light volume environments and heavy volume, dynamic environments, and what happens when you've got tsunamis and so forth and so forth. So, uh, you know, um, it just is just a matter of, of trying. And when you are trying new things, there is absolutely nothing wrong with trading on a simulator or doing one lots because when you earn in that learning process, you just don't want to pay for your education like it's a Harvard PhD, right? You want to pay for your education like it's the, the cheapest online junior college that you don't have to fork out much money for, okay? Don't lose money in your learning process and just understand that it takes a while to feel confident in something and you're only going to feel confident if you do your own work. and, and it, it, sure, it's fine to go to a chat room or like see, oh, see where I'm initiating a trade or I'm pointing out bull divergences or bear divergences or whatever the case may be or hearing somebody call something on the Internet. But you know what? In the long run, it's going to mean nothing to you because you have to learn to see the things for yourself. 
and just give it time, just understand it's a process, and in the long run, you need to do your own work. All right, no more. I'm not lecturing on anything more uh, than that. Um, okay, I don't use one-minute charts, so what do I use for day trading scalping? Do I use tick charts? Absolutely. I love the tick charts, especially the way they condense the overnight activity. Um, if you uh, look at our LBR chat video, we actually have two videos running, one off the Hotcom, which shows just the uh, photon trader charts, and the other one's like a trade station chart. And I love keeping a 5,000 tick chart and an 18,000 tick chart up there. And they sort of approximate a 5 and a 15 minute uh, type of time frame. So I, I adore the momentum divergences that form on those time frames. You can see if you looked at a 5,000 tick chart today, it's very similar to kind of a little bit of loss of momentum at the top of that five-minute chart, regression to the mean, sold off down to that uh, to that 13 uh, high-volume node, yada, yada, yada. So, yeah, I do like the tick charts a lot. Um, all right. Oh, yeah, anything anything you can read about Wyckoff on the web. Hank Pruden is the number one Wyckoff person out there in my book. He teaches out at Golden Gate University, and he's published all kinds of articles on the uh, Internet. And to me, I think he is the uh, most consistent and well-versed uh, practitioner and teacher of Wyckoff uh, I've ever met. And there's so much free information out there for you. You know, it doesn't, doesn't take much. Uh, I remember years ago I got that, uh, that uh, Stock Market Institute course, you know, I paid like $1,000 for this thing, I don't know, 20 plus years ago, you know, and, and honestly, I mean, you, you can condense it all into about 20 pages, the essence of it, and you can find that for free on the Internet. So that's my two cents worth. Uh, you can you can find so much on the internet. Has the high frequency traders affected my trading over the years? Uh, absolutely not. I am so grateful that there is high frequency traders out there to provide liquidity. I've seen what happens when they turn the machines off and these things go spinning up or down. Uh, I mean, it's a luxury, guys, to have volume there that you can bang, you know, 50 at the market if you have to get out of something and be filled with no slippage. So I absolutely am grateful that there's high-frequency trading out there. And with that said, you have to understand that that has become a catch-all for so many different things out there. First of all, you've got the market-making algorithms, buy on bid, sell on offer. Honestly, they do not make money anymore. Get what was one of the ones that founded that game. Then you had Citadel, Peak Six, all these guys joining in. They're not profit centers anymore, uh, but but they're still out there. And then you had a little bit more of the strategic algorithms, a little bit more uh, strategy oriented, such as breakouts from these coils that you can see on the tick charts. And this is where you'll see the volume spikes come in on this one minute data. And you know what I say? If you can't beat them, join them. You know, they're marking the market up for you. They're giving you an advantage point if you're on the right side of something. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and, there, and there's ways that you can find to play that same game, too, if you want. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't try to day trade on that short of a time frame, but uh, no, they haven't affected anything. What has changed, though, and I do believe I saw an interview with Peter Stottlemyre about this about uh, eight years ago. What has changed is because you've got the broadband everywhere, <clears throat> the, um, you know, everybody's smarter, everybody's very technical. It used to be that it would take the market a little bit longer to digest news. For example, you know, if we started breaking out from a chart formation, you'd see you'd get five or six little two to three minute <clears throat> or five minute continuation patterns, little pauses or flags. It was a, a slam dunk. And now what do you see? Horses left the barn. Dog pile. You're either in or you're not. You jump on board. You either have buy stops in or you buy at the market or you're left in the dust waiting for that little one to two minute pause. So I don't think that's just the fact that there's high frequency trading. I think it's that people are smarter. Everybody's technical. You can execute a basket with one button click. And uh, it, that's just the way the business is done now. Um, 
Lastly, let's see, we've got time for two or three more questions, and then I know that Mike is dying to give you guys the quiz on everything now that I've already made you forget everything that I talked about in our little lecture. Uh, do I have a view on trading VIX futures? Yes, don't. Okay, do I have a view on trading VIX options? Yes, don't. Okay, wasted time, no edge. There's far superior products to make a living off of than VIX futures. Do I scale out of trades or recommend off-type positioning? 80% um, of the time, uh, I'm all in or all out, but with that said, it really depends on the basis for the trade. Remember, there's some chart formations that lead to trail a stop. There's other chart formations that are exit for a small target only. So uh, it depends. If you're day trading with the S&Ps, I don't know. Is there a whole lot of edge towards scaling out? Usually if you scale out, what will happen is you'll get out of the good trades too early and you get banged on the bad ones for the whole amount. So uh, see how it's proving out in your bottom line. What are the months or times not to trade? July or August? No, don't make blind statements, guys. Don't make absolutes like that. Do you guys remember how July and August were four to five years ago? Fabulous. Do you remember that uh, Arab Spring and the, the disastrous summer in Europe a couple years ago? So don't rule that one particular month. In fact, I will tell you some fabulous research by... Larry McMillan, who's done the best research on the VIX futures and, and volatility uh, than anybody I know, and actually there is a seasonal bias that you make your lows for the implied volatility two weeks on either side of July 4th. Who would have guessed? All right, so you tend to see a contraction in the implied volatility Ever since uh, April and May, you get this contraction in the volatility and June, and then you tend to make a cycle low for the year, plus or minus two to three weeks on either side of July 4th. And Steve Moore will tell you from doing seasonal work that that will work about 85% of the time back testing and about 65 to 70% of the time on a walk forward basis. So uh, anyway, take that with a grain of salt. All right, guys. You guys were an awesome crowd. What a pleasure to present to you guys. Now stick around for Big Mike, and do join me at the end of June when we can get into some good old-fashioned swing trading. Linda, thank you. thanks again very much for your time today. I have two quick questions of my own for you before you go and before we uh, do the quiz questions. Uh, first, can you tell us, there's a lot of traders that are struggling, as you know, and they do not have the support from their friends or family, uh, significant others, so forth. Uh, what's it like being married to a trader, and do you have any advice for traders that are going through similar situation where they don't really have the support from their family? Um, well, what's it like being married to a trader? Um, that's a good one because I'm divorced from my first husband <laughs> who was a trader on the floor. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that's a loaded question there. But I will tell you two things regardless if you're married or not and regardless if you're struggling or not and so forth. And, you know, it's there are many challenges and, and, uh, in any profession, you know, in any profession. And I, I think that... Two things have helped me when I've had long flat periods, which I've had, or, or drawdown periods. I'll, I'll tell you three things that have helped me because, seriously, you know, I've been doing this for 33 years full time, and I will tell you, every single year there has not been a period where I felt like quitting. You know, even when I was down on the trading floor in the early 80s, it would get so dead in the month of December. I'd be like, well, this is the stupidest thing in the world. I can't, I can't do anything. You can't create the paper flow. You're there at the market's mercy. You know, there's always periods like, where I'm like, ah, you know, should I just hang it up or whatever. Um, so, you know, it, it's never an easy game is what I'm saying. It's never an easy game even for me. So my, the things that I do for myself are I have a pile of positive thinking books that I've collected over the years, and I'm serious about this because I do keep them on my bedside. And I do believe it's a brainwashing process. So anytime I'm feeling down or demoralized or frustrated or whatever, I randomly pick up one of those books and I open it to the middle and I just read a paragraph and I'm like, God meant for me to read this paragraph, okay? So I'm a big believer in that. You know, it keeps me going. And, um, you know, then I always try to keep in mind all the inspirational stories of sports athletes that I've seen over the years. Like, for example, Andre Agassi, when he dropped so far down in the rankings that he wasn't even ranked anymore, 
And then he came back and won the French Open. And I watched him win that thing. And he was like down. He was ready to lose game point. And God knows how he pulled that out. It was like it's just waiting for that one opening where you can convert. So if, if you study the, the sports psychology and so forth, it's, or you, you understand cards, it's staying in the game. That is 99% of the equation, staying in the game and, uh, and not losing money until you get that one green light go or that one opening or you do that one piece of research that gives you confidence. And like I said, probably 95% of my research goes to waste. I mean, I can't tell you how many countless of hours I've done modeling and it's like, ah, you know, throw your hands up. Well, you know, you just never use it or whatever. But at least I feel I'm doing something productive, you know, because a lot of times you don't feel like you're doing anything productive. Now, two other things, very important. You must have something outside of trading. You must do something physical or something therapeutic. I don't care if it's gardening or walking your dog or hitting a tennis ball or jogging. You must do something outside of the markets to give your mind a break from being too consumed by this because you'll just start digging yourself into a hole. You need to be able to come fresh fresh and, and, and feel invigorated. And, and if you feel a little bit beat down, there's nothing wrong with taking a couple days off too. So the motivational books, do something outside of the market. Have your own faith or belief system. If your spouse isn't particularly supportive, find a buddy. You know, there's enough buddies online, seriously. Develop a trading buddy and you can like commiserate with or, or you know, serve to do checks on each other. And then lastly, you know, your own health will make a big influence on that. And of course, in addition to the physical, there are things you can do in terms of, you know, watching the way that you're eating, keeping your blood sugar level, or, you know, not going out and hitting the bottle too, uh, you know, too heavy the, during the weeknights. You know, guys, you guys know what I'm talking about there. So, uh, you know, keep a, a, a physically fit body, and I think it'll help your mind be in a better place. And then spiritually take care of that spiritual side of yourself one way or another, either through friends or create a support network online. Uh, and just know that everybody's been there. You know, in my worst periods when I felt so down or screwed up, you know, years ago, and I just couldn't believe I did some of the dumb things. I'd, I'd tell another trader, trader buddy, I can remember he was on the floor of the Philadelphia Stock Exchange where I traded for a number of years. I'm like, oh, man, you know, I can't believe I did that, man. I just lost like $20,000. And he goes like, oh, that's not so bad. I, I just lost $200,000. Oh, man, I felt so much better when he said that. I'm like, oh, my God, somebody screwed up worse than me. You know, so it happens to all of us. It's just part of the game. And the best feeling in the world, guys, is making back a loss. That is more empowering than having a big win. So if you make back that one drawdown, or that one big loss, you know you can do it again. And that in and of itself is worth fighting for, worth fighting to understand that even just nickel and diming to get some steady consistency every day, it, it, it's worth it. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. And, and one more quick question of mine before we let you go and then we go on to the giveaways. Uh, for all of those out there that are wanting to follow you, that are wanting to see your trades, that are wanting you to be their mentor, do you offer anything like that? What's uh, what's the process? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I have to confess, I I've, I just don't do mentoring, and uh, I mean, I respect the people that do because it's incredibly uh, energy intensive, and um, you know, so I, I just don't really do anything like that. I, I have given. Uh, one or two workshops, uh, you know, over the years to, for the online trading expo. I, I don't think I'm going to do that. Hey, it's, I'm happy to I'm happy to lecture in your room, Big Mike. <laughs> but I mean, I do have this. Um, you know, I've, I've had it closed, but I, I I'll, I'll I'll open it again if you want to sign my guest book. I'll set up a little notice, and you can do a a little three day free trial, or I don't I'm, I don't know. I have you know what I'm going to do yet? Just open up for a week for free or something like that. It's something that I've had for uh, 13 years. And uh, I have a new assistant, so we've sort of been uh, getting a steady rhythm down. And, you know, I, I have to admit that I got to the point where I had carpal tunnel so badly I couldn't, I couldn't type into these chat rooms so much anymore, you know. So I, I just went to audio, and, and I found out, you know, the best way for me to do this is just to, like, make the trades. I'll show you what I'm doing, good, bad, and ugly, you know. And, uh, you know, if that is helpful in learning, 
uh, great. You know, we used to sit there and, and call trades all the times, and I found that like there was a little bit of a conflict there with uh, with my hedge fund. You know, it was awkward uh, since I I might get multiple fills and stuff. It was just a little bit awkward, and you know, our holding time was longer. So now now we're gravitating to this format of just just showing the day trades and and uh, using options for position stuff. And and if you want to. Um, you know, I, I should open the thing back up, and you can trial. And it's just a—it's just like a little group, like any chat room. It's—it's it's, uh, you know, there's dozens of them out there, and I think that they serve a purpose in providing a little bit of camaraderie and, and community for people, a little bit of humor at lunchtime. You know, the the fellow members. We've got two rooms. One sort of this market profile room, you know, and the other one, you know, is just more standard swing trading, and and they do their own thing and and post their patterns, and then I I do my own thing and. Um, okay. So, uh, it's okay. Pretty straightforward. Great. All right, guys. So uh, you can find that on Linda's website at lbrgroup.com and sign the uh, the guest book as she's requested. Okay, Linda. So uh, we'll let you go. I know you're very busy, and then I'm going to move on to the five quiz questions and get those books handed out. So again, Linda, thank you very much, and I look forward to having you back in June. Well, I'm here for those questions. Believe me, I want to see people's answers. Just how okay. were they paying attention, or how did it, how good a job did I do of communicating this information? You know, okay. has it completely disappeared from people's brains now that I've blabbed here? Okay, so I'm going to take control back here and share my screen. Okay, guys, so the way that uh, we handled the quiz questions here on BMT is we have five books to give away today. So to try to keep it fair for everyone, whether they're a fast or slow typer, uh, what we do is you know the first person to answer quiz question number one correctly will win. The second person with the correct answer for question number two will win. And then by the time we get to the fifth book, we're looking for the fifth person that answers correctly. So that way you don't have to be the first or the fastest to win. Okay, so here comes uh, question number one, and uh, guys, just type the question into the box, and then give me a, a few minutes or a few seconds after each one so I can coordinate, figure out who the winner is. Question one, what is the classic definition of support and resistance? So we're, we're kind of looking for two data points here. And Linda, uh, if you want, you can pick the answers since you're still here. It's up to you or I can. Two data points. You got it. Okay. Need to have two data points. Need to have a test there right. for support or resistance. So, uh, Rangan, I need your BMT username, please, if you would type that in. So the answer is the two data points. The market must have a test or higher low or slightly lower low for support to be defined was the answer. So Rangan is the winner, and I just need your BMT username, and I'll follow up with you uh, to get that into your hands. Okay, got it. And question two. What are two chart formations that test out better to trail a stop than to play for a fixed target with regards to money management strategies? So we're looking for the second person that answers correctly here. Well, I wanted to see uh, you've got either the converging trend lines, which forms a wedge or a triangle, or that breakout from support or resistance after that sideways line. So right. uh, wedge and triangle is pretty much the same thing. Right. Okay. So, uh, Julie, I need your BMT username, please, Julie Wade, and I will get with you after the webinar to get that into your hands. So just type your BMT username, please, Julie. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll email you. All right, question three. What are two, what are the, sorry, what are two of the variables that put volume into context? Okay, 
<laughs> there you go. Time of day and market structure. Okay. Uh, Michael, Michael S., I need your BMT username, please. Okay. Write that down. All right. It comes to fourth. Volume divergences are accompanied by... Momentum divergences, there you go. You could use any oscillator. You could have a, a oscillator divergence too, which shows up as a momentum divergence. Okay. Uh, so Jill, go ahead and just give me your BMT username, please. Okay. All right, and fifth and final question. What is a clue that a volume spike might be a buying or selling climax? End of the move with no break of support or resistance. So you've got uh, range expansion. It can't be immediate break of uh, support or resistance. So yeah, it has to be away from support or resistance at the end of a move. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you see a particular person that answered that? Let's see. The stuff is scrolling by so fast here. Uh, well, I'd just say far away from support or resistance there is basically the essence of it. Right. So is that JP? Yep. Okay. Uh, JP, can I get your BMT username, please? Okay. All right. So once again, Thanks very much to Linda. Uh, for everybody that's waiting for the recording, I'll work on it later today, and I'll post it tomorrow. I'll also send the recording to Linda. Uh, Can I so give you my parting shot here? Yeah, absolutely. My favorite line of all times. How many of you guys saw Steve Martin, the jerk? You remember when he's yeah. up there at the, can at the uh, carnival, and the boss comes up, and he's like, oh, man, how are you doing today? And, and Steve's like, oh, geez, you know, terrible. We're just giving away all this stuff here. I feel so badly. And then... <laughs> You know, the boss explains to him that he's taking in, you know, and giving away this worthless crap. And he's like, ah, it's a profit deal. I get it. Okay, so I, I couldn't help it. I like <laughs> to slip that in. That's my favorite line. All right, Linda. So thanks very much. Uh, thanks, guys, for being here. And I'll see everybody on the forum. And, Linda, I'll see you again in, uh, what, about six weeks or so. Night, gang. <laughs>